Lord bless you. Welcome to worship on this beautiful uh, Ash Wednesday service. This is at home online worship and we're glad to welcome you into our time together. For this service, it would be helpful if you have your Bible, if you'd like to follow along in the scriptures. And also, if you've had a chance to prepare the ashes, uh, if not, just join in the service and, uh, and uh, be part of it that way. Having a candle, the flame represents the presence of the Holy Spirit of God as he leads us in worship and speaks to our hearts. If you need to do some preparation, just hit the pause button and we'll wait until you get back. As we begin our worship, we're going to begin with singing a wonderful hymn that's so appropriate for uh, Lenten uh, beginnings. The hymn is, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross on Which the Lord of Glory Died. <laughs> Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia, Paul spent all his time preaching the word. He, re he testified to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. But when they opposed and insulted him, Paul shook the dust from his clothes and said, your blood is upon your own heads. I am innocent. From now on, I will go preach to the Gentiles. Then he left and went to the home of Titius Justus, a Gentile who worshiped God and lived next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, and everyone in his household believed in the Lord. Many others in Corinth also heard Paul, became believers, and were baptized. One night, the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision and told him, Don't be afraid. Speak out. Don't be silent, for I am with you, and no one will attack and harm you, for many people in this city belong to me. 
So Paul stayed there for the next year and a half, teaching the Word of God. A normal Christian experience at conversion is excitement and joy. This is most often called first love. Many people, many Christians, lose this first love prematurely. And I say prematurely because, first of all, first love is something which should not be lost. Uh, rather, it should mature. It should change, but not be lost. It should mature so that the Christian can be everything that Christ has designed him to be. Mature love includes joy and excitement and God's gift of the strength and the skill to serve. Mature love is better and richer than first love. It's not the absence of first love, it's the maturing of first love. Very often, the cold water committee in a church prematurely, unfortunately, turns the spiritual fire in a new believer into muddy gray ashes. Members of the self-appointed keep them in line committee are generally the unwilling who see anything different or new as unholy and therefore unnecessary. The cold water committee in any church is unfortunately unsighted. Now, there have been a lot of sermons preached about the cold water committee that imposes a devastating effect of depression and defeatism on the human spirit. It douses the fire, you might say. Christ, we know, is a victor over sin and death and gloom. Why then should Christians face life with a defeated spirit when we serve a risen Savior? Well, certainly we shouldn't, but I know myself, and I know you too. I know us too well to brush aside the reality that we often suffer from negativism and doubt and fear. Many people live on the edge of giving up, and I wish to speak a word of comfort to you this day about that. When, what if you've already fallen victim to the committee's effort? <laughs> I mean, you've been doused. You were once on fire for Christ, and you've been doused by the cold water committee. Serving has become more a job than a joy. Witnessing has waned, and prayer is like doing penance. And sitting through a worship celebration <laughs> it's like paying taxes. In Scripture, we find somebody who was just like that. The Apostle Paul had lost the joy and victory of walking with Jesus. He had failed at Athens, and we read that in Acts chapter 17. And in Acts chapter 18, we find out he didn't do a whole lot better at Corinth. In fact, we read that Paul was urgently pleading with those that he witnessed to that they would stop ignoring him. That's the old expression, love me or hate me, just don't ignore me. The worst is to be ignored. And Paul had this great news about Jesus Christ to share, and they were ignoring him. Here we have the image of the consummately depressed child of God. For Paul, it was burnout city. And frankly, why not? Paul was ill and his friends were far away. Paul was surrounded by pagan lifestyles, the Epicurean philosophy, eat, drink, and be merry. And the religious community was just steeped in idol worship. Quite frankly, if I were in that scenario, I would be tempted to turn the wall, turn to the wall, and just give it all up. Have you ever been in a valley like that? Are you in one right now? What do you do with a rejected, burned out, depressed failure of a Christian life like Paul, like me, like you? What can you do to get it back? What can you do to get that joy back? I believe that our discipline of ashes has the key to finding our way back into joy, the kind of joy that the Apostle Paul, Peter, uh, called unspeakable and full of glory. Joy unspeakable and full of glory. I'd like for you to come with me as we take a look at what Paul did and what God did in Paul as the Apostle discovered what to do when all you've got left for your work in Christ is dust. You make ashes. That's exactly what we're going to do in a few moments. We're going to take the ashes and place them on our body as a sign of who owns that body and what Christ will do with people who are willing to bend their knees in the valley so that Jesus can lift them to the place of shining on the mountaintop. So here's what Paul did. And there are three 
definite acts I want to share with you about what Paul did here. First of all, he continued in the work. He continued in the work that God called him to. When we realize our humanity, the fact that we can get depressed, that we can uh, kind of lose our way, lose our focus, in realizing our humanity, we begin to understand that there are times of success and failure. But we're not the ones responsible for the outcome of it all. We're not called to succeed. We are called, as the saying goes, to be faithful. Paul wrote about that to the Galatian church. He said, let's not get tired of doing what's good. At just the right time, we'll reap a harvest of blessing if, big word, if we don't give up. To be faithful, we have to keep our eyes on the goal. Just like a golfer eyeing a birdie putt keeps his eye on that ball and on that hole where that ball needs to go. Or a place kicker has to watch the target, has to focus in on those goal posts before he kicks. Paul knew that he was susceptible to depression, so he kept his heart tuned to the voice of Jesus. That Great Baptist preacher C.H. Spurgeon once admitted to his very large congregation that his sense of depression was like, quote, a horror of great darkness. That it was only the everlasting arms underneath him that held him up sometimes. We realize we don't do it in our own strength. It's just as natural to have a momentary struggle with depression as it is to find joy and fellowship with Christ. The idea is to make it a momentary struggle, not a career. One way is to continue in the work. As we look to the needs of others in our community, continuing in the work of God, we find the mind of Christ. And we're saved from the pit of despair by those everlasting arms that hold us up. Paul took the dust of his failure at Athens and Corinth And he added the oil of Christ's promises to make ashes fit for continuing in the work that God called him to. And so should we. The second thing that Paul did is he counted on his mates in the ministry. He depended on people, the church. You know, when we have endeavored to continue in the work by realizing our humanity and acknowledging that there are times we get depressed, and that it's God's work, we can also discover that we have a great dependency and we can depend on the body of Christ. Paul needed his fellow ministers. They loved him, they needed him, and they believed in him when not many others did. And you know, I wanted to say confessionally that you have been this to me many times, often unknowingly, I'm sure, but perhaps I ought to tell you more often, I depend on you, mates in the ministry. Mates in the ministry provide a very practical help that refreshes. Our text says that Paul was pressed in the spirit. That means he received a powerful moving deep within that he would not disobey, that he could not disobey. My son used to have this radio controlled model car. It it had a device inside of it, a receiver, Uh, that received the signal and operated the motor and the steering and it had to obey the signal except when the battery runs down. Paul's spiritual battery had run down and he needed a recharging and that's exactly what he got from his friends. When Silas and Timothy came and visited Paul they brought some news that would reload anybody's battery couple of things, they were there in person, first of all. They came, they cared, so they went. A friend's face, a friend's embrace is always a cause for rejoicing. And they brought financial aid from the brothers at Philippi. How wonderful it is to be thought of tangibly at times. Send a card, send a gift, bring a gift. Then they also brought news of how the church at Thessalonica was flourishing and faithful. Now, this was a gift to Paul because it was his past effort that was starting to pay off back at Thessalonica. And knowing that past effort is currently bearing fruit is a panacea for the palace. If you need something to pull you out of depression, find out, hear about how God has blessed your efforts. Depression has haunted everybody who serves God in some way. 
the missionaries on the field are not uh, immune to this kind of loneliness and difficulty. You and I are now in a great field of depressive COVID-19 changes and restrictions. We need to learn to count on each other as mates in the ministry. One of the things I do for introspection and for review of my life and ministry is I keep a personal journal. I want to share with you an entry, uh, a few lines from many years ago when a mate in ministry meant all the difference for me. Quote, Today, I was depressed again. I got up from attempting to rest so I could work on the evening sermon. As I sat at the desk, the tears started again. No heaving sobs, just the bottom of despair. Elizabeth got up and moved towards me. I told her, I think I may lose my mind. She didn't say a thing. She just reached out, touched my cheek with the back of her fingers. It was the simplest of things to do, but she touched me. And it may have been the kindest single thing any mortal has ever done for me. I was able to continue. Paul continued in the work and he counted on his mates in the ministry, and so should we. But thirdly, he also considered different approaches. Sometimes just continuing on in the work and counting on your mates is not going to have the total effect needed to accomplish whatever God has called you to do. Sometimes things are tougher, like they are right now. Paul was faithful in delivering the word. That was continuing in the work that God called him to. That was his calling, but in this case, it served to draw the battle lines more clearly. His mates were very far away. And the text says that his opponents there, who weren't far away, opposed themselves, meaning that they actively aligned in opposition against Paul. They were planning to disable Paul's work and get rid of Paul, if they, even if they had to kill him. They blasphemed, attributing the work that Paul was doing in Christ's name to the work of the devil. That's what blasphemy is. Paul had been tolerated up to this point, but if he was going to witness uh, anything but mildly, I mean, they were not going to stand for that. They wouldn't stand for the kind of fanaticism that really believed in Jesus Christ, and that would make a difference, and that happens every time. The more you depend on Jesus Christ, the more some people are going to despise what you're doing. Sometimes Decisions about the effectiveness of our approach have to be made. Uh, logically, our call is to be faithful, delivering the word of God to everybody who will listen, who will hear it. We're not responsible for the outcome, but we are to observe closely how the word is received and then act accordingly. Sometimes we have to change our methods. Jesus gave that kind of instruction to the disciples concerning those who uh, would not receive the word. In Matthew chapter 10, we read about how Jesus told them, shake the dust off your sandals and go on down the road to the next place. In other words, if somebody won't receive the gospel, find somebody who will. Even when it becomes necessary to change our methods, our purpose is always redemptive. Paul had to give up his efforts inside the synagogue at Corinth, but he never got too far from the synagogues. What he did was he moved right in next door with uh, Titius Justice, uh, living right next door to the synagogue. Here was a Gentile living next door to the synagogue, and Paul moves in with the Gentile. If anything was going to make those Jews mad, it was another Jew moving in with a Gentile. Paul's hope was to be redemptive, to stay close enough to help any who were curious about this Christ that he was preaching, and his purpose remained firm and unshaken. He simply changed his approach, his tactics, his way of reaching people. Note, there is some evidence in Scripture here that joy returned to Paul in three different ways. First of all, he was given a convert in Crispus. Crispus was the head of the synagogue right next door. And you know, when you've got the head, the rest tend to follow Sometimes when we let go, God really does move in and give a revival. Secondly, God spoke to Paul. How good it is to hear, as the song goes, 
that voice falling on my ear, the sweet calling of Jesus. And thirdly, Paul's ministry was extended there at Corinth 18 months. He had more problems, certainly, but the crisis of losing joy was past. And he was refreshed, and he could minister once again. If you've lost your joy, and it feels like all you have got left is dust, let me encourage you to be a Paul. Continue in the ministry. Don't give up. Count on your mates, and if necessary, change your approach. But when you find it again, when you find your way, when you find your approach, be a Silas, be a Timothy, be a Barnabas, be an encourager to others. Refresh them, renew them, help them turn their dust into ashes, the mark of Jesus Christ on their life and ministry. And your witness, your ministry will extend through those you encourage. Well, to receive our ashes, we move into a time of confession, a sign of contrition and willingness to follow Jesus. So I ask you to uh, uh, note the words on the screen and let's join in together, uh, confessing our sins, to be forgiven of our sins as we receive the ashes, the sign. Lord, we are tired of doing things our way. The benefits are temporary and the effects are long lasting. People said, so Lord, we come running back to you. Lord, we have gone astray. We're guilty of living contrary to your word, your will and your way. But Lord, we come running back to you. Lord, you're coming back soon and very soon. We want to be ready when you return. Yes, Lord, we come running back to you. Lord, we fear you. This fear doesn't run us away from you, but it keeps us running back to you. My Lord, we come running back to you. We cry out to you, Lord. We ask for forgiveness. We recall the price you paid for us on Calvary. Thank you, Lord. We come running back to you. At this time, Lord, we choose to fast and pray. We seek to separate ourselves from our fleshly desires in order to concentrate wholly on you. Hold us fast, Lord. We come running back to you. Lord, we meet you here in this special place of gathering. We rejoice in knowing that you are able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask, think, or even imagine according to the power which is at work within us. With our sacrifices of praise and worship, we come running back to you now all together. God, we glorify you today. Thank you for not giving up on us. Thank you for not throwing us away or casting us aside. Thank you for not dealing with us as we so deserve. Thank you for love that covers a multitude of sins. With wide open arms, you have received us, so we come running back to you. After I pray, asking blessing on these ashes. Uh, we're going to receive the ashes. We impose them. Uh, usually, if you're in the church, you come in a line, and one by one we receive uh, the ashes. <coughs> the minister will place it on the forehead, and that's what we'll do. Only each one of us will do it for ourselves, or perhaps one in your family will uh, uh, do that for the others. But what we'll do is we'll uh, dip our finger into the ashes and place a visible cross on the forehead, or perhaps simply a fingerprint. Let God use the cross on your forehead or the fingerprint to remind others of his claim on your life and the grace that awaits those who will come to the open, outstretched arms of our Lord. Uh, after I pray and we receive the ashes, as we're receiving the ashes, we'll be uh, viewing about a three-minute uh, recorded segment of just that, of people receiving the ashes and praying. It was recorded at Mount Zion about three years ago, before masks, by the way. You'll note that uh, uh, there are no surgical masks evident in this video. Let's join together as we ask God to bless the ashes as we receive them. 
Father, bless these ashes we now impose on our foreheads as a sign of your cross extended to our work for your kingdom. Nothing we've ever done qualifies us to receive such a blessing as to be called Christian or little Christ. It is only by your grace that we are not incinerated for our sins like the ashes before us, but by that grace we are healed and called to come closer to you and experience joy unspeakable and full of glory. For the glory, the honor, and praise to which you alone are worthy, O Lord, we pray in the name of the Son, cooperating with the Spirit, to exalt and magnify the majesty of the Father. Let it be so in each of our lives, we pray. Amen. Friends, thank you for worshiping with us. We appreciate your tuning in. We invite you to come in person this coming Sunday. We're beginning a new Lenten series of messages entitled From Inward Seeking to Outward Serving. We ask you to join us. You can come to either Mount Zion United Methodist Church in Bennett, North Carolina, or Pleasant Hill United Methodist Church in Seagrove. Mount Zion is at 930 and Pleasant Hill is at 11 o'clock. The address and contact information are on the screen. You can call or email with your questions or prayer requests or for more information. We are glad that you worship with us. May God richly bless you.